Hello, I'm Sam Stovall, Chief Investment Strategist of CFRA Research, and I am joined by David Holt, Senior Equity Analyst at CFRA, as well as Jeff Eliason from Peak Capital Management. We're here today to talk to you about our outlook for the equity markets in 2021, as well as offering you some portfolio investment ideas. Before we get started, however, let me introduce you to CFRA. And as we see on the upcoming slide, CFRA is an independent equity research firm. Uh, we offer investment research, uh, fundamental equity research, as well as ETF and mutual fund research, forensic research, et cetera, to clients all the way from the spectrum of the institutional investor to the retail investor. Uh, for retail investors, you might be familiar with a snapshot of our flagship publication, The Outlook, uh, on the far right-hand side of this slide, which has been in existence since the early 1920s. If you'd like to get a trial to CFRA's investment research offering, Market Scope Advisor or The Outlook, uh, please go to CFRAResearch.com and request a trial. The upcoming slide will tell us what is the agenda that we have for today. Basically, I wanna cover quickly uh, three milestones that occurred last year. Talk about what is our price target for all of 2021 for the S&P 500. How did we get there? Um, and basically letting you know that we look toward historical precedent as well as using fundamental forecasts. And then David and Jeff will share with you some uh, CFRA peak capital management portfolio ideas. So if we go to the next slide, we can get a quick idea as to what happened in 2020. First off, we had milestone dates, as I mentioned. On February 19th, after the S&P had risen by 5%, uh, being sideswiped by the COVID virus, we then tumbled into a 34% bear market that took only 33 calendar days to go from peak to trough, which was the swiftest bear market on record. We then recovered all that we lost by August 18th, which was the third fastest recovery since World War II, primarily because investors could see beyond the valley because the Fed had taken instant and substantive action to help support the economy and propel us going forward. As a result, the S&P 500 ended higher by 16.3% for the full year. 64% of sectors within the S&P were in positive territory, and two out of every three sub-industries also were positive. But where do we go from here? As we see in the next slide, not only did we have very strong performances, uh, we ended up with 33 new all-time highs as compared with 23 on average going back to World War II but we paid for it in terms of volatility because we had 109 days in which the S&P 500 rose or fell by 1% in a single day, which was more than twice the average of 51 such days going back to World War II. So looking forward now, uh, first thing we can look at is how does the market typically perform under presidential cycles? So as this slide shows you, this is a uh, look back to the end of 1978, which is consistent to both the S&P 500 and the Russell 2000 index of small cap stocks. And as you can see, the return is typically pretty strong. S&P has gained an average of 14.3% in that first year uh, since 1978, whereas the small cap stocks have risen nearly 16%. Even better is that the small caps have never declined in the first year of a president's term in office, dating back to 1978. We typically see softness in the second year because midterm election years usually offer an awful lot of uncertainty, but then the third year of a president's term in office tends to be very strong as the party in power wants to stay in power, then tries to stimulate the economy so that it bears fruit by the time voters go back to the polls. So 
what about the political makeup that we have in Congress right now? As the next slide shows you, uh, we actually have a pretty good uh, scenario set up for us. There were essentially three political scenarios, a unified government where we have a Democratic or Republican president who is supported by a Democratic Congress, meaning both the House and the Senate are controlled by one party. Unified Congress says that you have a unified Congress that is of a different party than the president and a split Congress is as it describes. For all years since World War II, the market gained an average of 9%. Yet under unified governments led by a Democratic president, the market was up 9.8%. We had 22 of these calendar years and the FOA or frequency of advance was highest at 77%. So like a batting average, the market was up in 77% of all calendar years in which we had a democratically controlled unified government. What's more, real GDP posted its highest returns on average 4.3% as compared with 3.2 for all years. But obviously history is a guide, it's never gospel. Mark Twain might have said that history might not repeat, but it frequently rhymes. I also like to say, yeah, but sometimes like the singer of the national anthem, it forgets the words. So you have to overlay economic and fundamental forecasts. So in our next slide, what we see is, how did we come up with our target for, for the S&P 500 to close this year at 4080, which is about a nine and a half percent price appreciation for the full year? Well, one reason is because we're expecting a nice improvement in earnings, 20% plus for the S&P 500, uh, nearly 9% revenue growth. Uh, real GDP should also be on the rebound this year as compared with a minus 3.5% last year. Inflation is expected to remain under control and the Fed will probably not be raising interest rates this year or next year and it won't be until 2022 be before they start even thinking about raising rates. As a result, our belief is that we will not see a sharp uptick in the 10-year yield. Uh, the dollar will continue to weaken in this calendar year, uh, yet we have seen a firming of energy prices and we think the average will be uh, toward the mid $50 per barrel range. If we take a look at the next slide, we can look specifically at economic growth. You can see for 2020 that basically it's a sea of red ink, except for China, which is likely to be up more than 2% for the full year. Uh, global GDP down 4%, US down 3.5%, but a nice bounce back in 2021. Globally up more than 5%, and in the US just barely under 5%. So that's one reason why investors have been optimistic because they're looking across the economic valley. As we look in the next slide, we can see that this then translates to favorable impressions for the earnings valley. When looking here at the S&P 500, the S&P developed international markets and then the emerging markets. Um, and we see that earnings growth for the S&P is expected to be above 20%. For the developed international, more than 38%, and emerging markets also expected to be up more than 36%. So it's not just a large cap US recovery. And what is not shown here is that mid cap stocks within the US are expected to see earnings growth double that of our large cap forecast at closer to 40%. And small caps are expected to be up close to 80%. So Growth is definitely expected to be seen in large, but then bested by mid and even surpassed by small cap stocks. So where do we see most of the opportunities as we are entering into 2021? Well, as we take a look at the next slide, we look at this sector weightings and based on earnings expectations, based on seasonal uh, tendencies, based on the commitment, if you will, of the uh, stocks within a particular sector by the CFRA equity analysts, meaning what percent of the constituents have buy or strong buy recommendations, 
helps us come up with this sector recommendation list where we have overweight recommendations on consumer discretionary, industrials, materials, the cyclical sectors, as well as healthcare, yet we are underweighting the defensive areas of consumer staples, real estate, and utilities. But the reason you're here is to listen to us talk about portfolios. How can you put your money to work that will help outperform the overall market as a whole or at least provide an improved risk adjusted return. Well, let me show you why it's worth listening to us. As we see in the next slide, we have about 11 portfolios that are offered by CFRA equity analysts. The three best performers, the intrinsic value, high quality capital appreciation and industry momentum portfolio are those three that are offered through CFRA and peak capital management. Intrinsic value posted its three-year compound annual growth rate of 19% through the end of 2020 versus the S&P equal weight 500's th uh, three-year compound annual growth rate of a shade below 10%. The high quality capital appreciation and industry momentum portfolio were neck and neck at just below 12%. So let me talk quickly about the industry momentum portfolio. What is in the industry momentum portfolio and how does that translate to what is available on the peak uh, and CFRA websites? First off, there's the old saying of momentum, let your winners ride, but cut your losers short. By owning the worst three sectors on a rolling 12 month basis uh, each month, and then holding them to the next month and then reevaluating the, th the uh, three worst performing sectors. This strategy of, in a sense, buy low with the hope of selling high would not have worked out too well because the bottom three sectors continued to remain underperformers, uh, posting a compound annual growth rate of 3.3% versus the average 8.4 uh, for the S&P 500. Also, that 30% within the blue bar indicates that this strategy beat the market only 30% of the time. Yet by owning top sectors within the S&P, the compound annual growth rate was 10.9%, beating the market 70% of the time. The industry momentum portfolio dives a little bit deeper and buys those sub-industries that are in the top 10% on a rolling 12 month basis and then holds them uh, until the next month when they are then evaluated based on their trailing 12 month price performance. And this strategy dating back to 1989 outperformed the market uh, with a 13.4% compound annual growth rate and a frequency of beating the market at 77%. This portfolio is found on CFRA's Market Scope Advisor platform. A variant of this is found in the CFRA Peak Asset Management offering, which uses the sub-industry level ETFs uh, that has a portfolio of five ETFs based on trailing performance that is then re-evaluated and rebalanced every month. To give you an idea of the kind of sub-industries and stocks found in there, let's take a look at the next slide which shows that there are about 22 stocks in there right now, uh, many of them coming from the industrials, information technology, and consumer discretionary sectors, but also a smattering of companies found in materials, healthcare, and communication services. So this portfolio found on MarketScope Advisor uh, is one that consists of all of these sub-industries whereas the industry momentum portfolio found on the CFRA peak website would consist of five ETFs that mimic those that are outperforming on a rolling 12 month basis. Now to help us understand the two other portfolios that are offered through CFRA and peak capital management, I turn the presentation over to David Holt, senior equity analyst who will discuss the intrinsic value and the high quality capital appreciation portfolios. David, take it away. Thanks for the handoff, Sam. And, and as always, I really appreciate the valuable input on the market. Uh, for a few minutes here, 
want to uh, switch gears and discuss a couple model portfolios that Peak Capital and CFRA are partnered with. Um, first up would be Intrinsic Value, which is a quantitative rules-based portfolio, and High Quality Capital Appreciation, which is the actively managed portfolio, both of which have, have done well over long-term time span. So now on slide 16 and right out of the gate, I thought it would be helpful to really establish uh, some of the key vantage points for each respective portfolio. So with the help of the quant team, we routinely conduct a, a standard regression analysis to show how tightly correlated each portfolio is to each specific uh, investment style and type of companies each um, have gravitated towards historically. So likewise, I think this also helps you as a client to really help determine which portfolio is really the right fit and how these portfolios can perform in a variety of different market scenarios when accounting for specific risk factors. So for example, here with intrinsic value, um, it has a larger focus on large cap growth companies with a tilt towards Russell, the Russell 1000 growth index, why high, high quality capital appreciation has a much more straddled the line approach between value and growth, but still focused on large cap companies. So the breakdown illustrated here um, will actually come into play in later slides, especially when we get into recent performance. But hypothetically, um, I think this also helps frame how companies can do in specific scenarios. So for example, say the inoculation of the pandemic uh, continues to lag expectations. It likely means stocks valued at 23 times next year earnings could be re-rated. Re so if that mean reversion were to happen, uh, the market had to digest some bad news. It likely means um, the group of cheaper valued larger cap companies like high quality capital appreciation or intrinsic value uh, could have a better chance of outperforming. So those are just a, a few different ways that we try to get in front of market risks so you don't have to. So now on slide 17, uh, where we've included some of the key factors of how to screen for companies that are included um, or taken out of the intrinsic value portfolio. So again, it's a rules-based portfolio that's rebalanced every March and September. Uh, so last quarter, I discussed how the portfolio naturally rotated itself to more economically sensitive names during the last rebalance, when, where you saw an increase in net exposure towards industrials and some financials, which actually helped in Q4. So however, from a more fundamental point of view, the screen criteria that, that really makes the portfolio attractive from a longer term time span actually worked against us in Q4, uh, where companies with more volatile swings in profitability and returns on invested capital actually outperformed by a, a really wide margin. So as a result, the larger concentration around technology was a drag in the quarter itself. Um, although that is disappointing, we still see um, and hold a long-term mindset here with this specific strategy and believe that the duration um, is a key advantage for an investor. So nothing has really changed and we will get into uh, more specific performance in later slides. To slide 18, we shift to high quality capital appreciation. So uh, if I step back and I were to describe um, what we look for in this specific portfolio and describe it with an analogy, it would be Robin. Robinson Crusoe. So we try to find names that you could hold and be stranded on an island for multiple years, and you wouldn't really have to worry about their competitive moat or their ability to compound earnings longer term. So uh, these durable characteristics, um, when coupled with a healthy dividend yield, probably make a good uh, value proposition, and they've really helped the portfolio perform well over a long-term time span. So more recently, we've added more economically sensitive names uh, like Ball, Ball Corporation that are further out on the risk curve. Um, other recent additions have been Charles Schwab, um, which have helped um, with some of the more emerging signs of a steepening yield curve, uh, given their leverage towards net interest income. So on the left-hand side of the slide, we lay out the key screen criteria of what we look for. Uh, we can also use quality rankings that help uh, capture those Caruso-like names, um, which you can see at the top left of the funnel. That serves more so as a guide for dur durability of earnings and dividends uh, from a 10-year ten look-back period. So from there, we really flex our muscles and deploy both a fundamental and forensic analysis, which I think we're the only indep independent research provider that can do that to really help ensure that we bring the best possible options to our portfolio committee to vote on.
Turning to slide 19, we have performance and how the portfolio has done against its bench over uh, different time periods. And this is for intrinsic value. So it remains a standout, this portfolio remains a standout and largely attributed to the quant team. So they've been able to really pinpoint uh, some of the steady growers with reasonable valuations that have outpaced uh, their respective bench over a, a long term time period. So while Q4 did lag, as I highlight here in the red box, the underperformance was largely due to that overweight in tech, which we've already went over in prior slides. But we still don't think that disrupts the longer term outlook or really the general performance for the portfolio. So as you can see from a one, a three, and a five and 10 year time frame, the portfolio is handily out, outpaced its bench. So now moving to slide 20, uh, we have high quality capital appreciation, which did not go as well. Um, and it actually lagged its benchmark in 2020. So as I've discussed uh, before, it's really around the constraints with the quality rankings and needing to enter the portfolio. And uh, it dramatically reduces your ability to really embrace risk and indirectly um, value oriented names in some cases. So. 4Q20 trailed its bench, but not quite as wide of a margin as intrinsic value as stocks kind of geared towards uh, the reopening play like Disney um, still helped. But um, from a longer term perspective with a, a three, five or a 10 year time frame, we would actually highlight the portfolio has performed well in both up and down markets since inception. Moving here lastly to slide 21. Uh, if you've turned, uh, tuned into to hear previous uh, quarterly updates, you've seen me use this, this set of data points before that the quant team has actually put together. So thanks again to them. Uh, capture rates remain largely unchanged for intrinsic value uh, with the blue bars capturing more than its fair share of returns during up markets and actually helping to preserve capital during down days and only capturing about 80% of, of total market downside. So high quality has followed a similar path but just not as tightly in up market scenarios for reasons that we went over in the previous slide. Um, I have added a few new data points under, character, under characteristics uh, near the bottom portion of the slide uh, with adding it. So in other words, uh, the rate of daily outperformance is solid for both portfolios and they're placed near the fifth percentile of large cap funds, according to Zephyr Analytics. So, I hope this overview of model portfolios was helpful. And with that, I will hand it over to Jeff to wrap up the call. Thanks, David, much appreciated. And thank you, Sam, for also sharing your insight. My name's Jeff Eliason. I serve as Chief Operations Officer and Chief Compliance Officer at Peak Capital Management. Peak Capital is an investment advisor located in Denver, Colorado, serving financial professionals um, uh, throughout the United States and also across Canada, the UK, Australia, and New Zealand. We're very fortunate with our partnership with CFRA Research to leverage uh, not only uh, their decades uh, of history in providing research to financial professionals and investors, uh, but also to take advantage of some of their best thinking and make those portfolios actionable as separate accounts. Peak Capital provides uh, these portfolios uh, that were covered today through third-party platforms uh, as a separate account manager and also by investing directly through Peak Capital. We recognize how challenging uh, 2020 has been, and certainly we head into the new year um, with uh, as many questions as we have answers. And our time today with both Sam and David gave clarity and perspective that is absolutely invaluable. And we're grateful that we can take that knowledge and wisdom and make it actionable for investors uh, through Peak Capital's uh, separate accounts and uh, investment management. If you'd like to learn more about Peak Capital, and we uh, move to the next slide, you can contact or reach us uh, either by email or phone, uh, reaching me directly at g eliason at sk-llc.com. 
Again, geoliason at sk-llc.com for additional information on our firm and also how to access uh, CFRA's best thinking and strategies through separate account management uh, at Peak Capital. Sam and David, again, so grateful for your time today, especially as both investors and financial professionals look for answers through a rules-based, dif disciplined approach and incredible years of research provided by CFRA Research. So with that, we look forward to hearing from our listeners. We thank you for your time and uh, attending today. And with that, uh, we'll close it out and look forward to talking with you soon. Thank you.